Hey everybody, I hope I can keep you all awake long enough to do this. Um, and thank you all very much for taking the interest and the time to come and listen to me tonight. So what I'm, I'm an optometrist, but I'm an optometrist with a very specific training. So I wasn't trained as all other optometrists do, but I went on and did further training. So my area of speciality is the vision connection in DCD or dyspraxia and how it affects development. So that's about me, my, that's my name. I'm a developmental behavioral optometrist. I'm also a professional clinical advisor to the Association of Optometrists in Ireland. I lecture in pediatrics, glaucoma, and what we call med medical retina. I do expert witness work. I'm a clinical director with Special Olympics, which is actually where I first heard about uh, behavioral optometry when I was being trained in the States. Um, a lot of my colleagues in clinical um, the clinical directors in Special Olympics are behavioral optometrists as well. So back in 2000, I was training, this was a really new thing. I'm a patient advocate for eye care. And I'm a mum of three, all of whom have lots of letters. <laughs> a lot, I have a lot of letters between DCD and ASD and cystic fibrosis and the whole lot. So... This is the reason I became a developmental optometrist. This is my princess, Isabella, who's now 13. And um, here Isabella's about six, five or six. And at that stage, she had already had two breaks with falls. And um, so what followed was, by the time she was 11, we had 13 breaks, 13 broken bones. I was a regular visit up to uh, BHI Swift Care. But Isabella was diagnosed with DCD at six, but as you know, we don't really diagnose neurodevelopmental before the age of eight because the child is so plastic. Now, you can make that diagnosis if it's very severe and the strong markers are there, but generally you'll have to go back and get it repeated once the child is eight. Isabella went on then to receive a subsequent diagnosis of ASD and ADHD when she was 11. And this is really common in DCD, and it's not. It, it explains a lot. It's nothing to be afraid of, and in fact, we have found it a very interesting journey. So, um, this is a picture of me. I did my research thesis in um, for my MSc, and I chose DCD visual behavior and literacy because I started at that stage seeing children in my clinic, and a, a high percentage of these children. I came in with diagnosis of dyslexia and had problems with eye movement. And I got to kind of thinking, well, there has to be a connection between what goes in and what's coming out. So I did quite a big research um, project on dyspraxia or DCD, visual behavior and how it affects reading. So then I went on to do, to finish my postgrad in behavioral and developmental optometry. And the, here, here in this photo, I was actually presenting my findings at the Children's Vision Development Conference up in Coleraine and Ulster University. And it was really interesting because there was a lot of talk about DCD and the one thing, and it hasn't changed a lot of this, very little research on dyspraxia and DCD, very little research. We still don't really know what causes it. We still don't really know, even making a diagnosis, um, even diagnosing it, diagnosing it can be quite tricky. And they recently changed the criteria. So, um, you know, and sometimes what can mask as dyspraxia can be something else and, and vice versa. So what my talk is going to be looking at is why is vision so important to development? Uh, why do people with DCD have these problems with vision and what are the problems? We're going to look at how the visual problems affect or affect development. I'm going to talk a little bit about what a behavioral optometrist is, because a lot of you said your children had eye tests and have 2020 vision. But unless you're all my patients, I'm guessing there's a fair whack of you out there that have never actually had a developmental uh, eye exam or your children hasn't had a developmental examination. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do to help. So first of all, we let's brief recap. Uh, DCD, it's a disorder which alters the development of motor control. It affects balance, it affects coordination, fine and gross motor skills, as well as organizational skills in the absence of any other pathology. And that's why it's actually very important if your child has had a diagnosis of DCD that there should be a pediatrician who can rule out, particularly if it's severe DCD, anything else, any other reason for this problem with balance and coordination. It was formerly known as dyspraxia and before that it was known as clumsy child syndrome. 
these people are neurologically immature. So what happens is in, in, neurologically, the, um, the development of the neurological system, the neurons from the brain out to the body don't develop at the same rate or in the same structures as in the typical population. And um, this population will also have a normal to quite a high IQ. So, you know, they might come across as a bit all over the place and a bit kooky, but they're actually very smart, as I'm sure you can all attest to. So it is effectively a disorder, a disorder of the neurological system and affects any part of the body that requires innervation to action, including the eyes. So how is it diagnosed? Uh, OTs, pediatricians and uh, physiotherapists are generally involved in a um, multidisciplinary diagnosis. Um, not so much in Ireland, uh, unless it's through the HSC, but in the UK and my colleagues in the US, it will be done as part of a multidisciplinary team. But because we in Ireland frequently have to go privately for these things, it gets a little bit messy in pulling all the, the different threads together. But the child will present with a motor coordination and social skill deficit, which is not it was below their chronological age. In other words, they just don't seem to be the same as their friends. And that's one of the reasons that it's generally around the age of seven or eight, we start to see this differential between the neurotypicals and our wonderful children with DCD. So it was formally recognized back in 1992 by the WHO when the diagnostic criteria were first drawn up. And um, since then they have actually tweaked those. So when I first qualified, in fact, you had to have fine and gross and sensory and or you had to have it all. Whereas now they will take fine on its own or gross motor skills on their own. Um, personally speaking, I think, particularly when the child is um, going into post-primary, at some stage, a psychological evaluation should be done as well, because there's a lot of other stuff that can go along with DCD, and you really need to get your ducks in a row to know how you're going to manage it going forward. Um, so out of interest, and this is something that we don't really do here in Ireland, the DSM-5, uh, which is, you know, sort of like the diagnostic manual for um, DCD, it uh, recommends a vision workup with a developmental or behavioral optometrist. And one of the reasons for this is, first of all, we need to be sure, be sure that vision, the child can see, so that the clumsiness of the problems that you know, are being picked up in the screening or in the assessment are not just simply because the child can't see. And I have had that here. I've had children come in with a query DCD diagnosis, and basically the kid just needed glasses and everything was fine. Because if you can't see, you can't do. So how does DCD affect the child or the adult? Because as you know, it's a lifelong thing. It doesn't go away and you don't grow out of it. Postural and balance difficulties. You might find the child will be sort of slightly hunched to one side or will have difficulty sitting still. They have poor core, they'll slide in the chair. Their problems with movement, ball skill deficits. The daddies will say, yeah, I can't catch the ball coming towards them. A lot of them will have uh, speech apraxia, there'll be speech and language problems, again, because of processing, language processing, and even just right down to, you know, the, the small muscles in the mouth and the lips and the tongue. And um, problems with fine motor skills, such as writing, make, uh, doing buttons, doing zips, sensory deficits with proprioception, which is kind of knowing where your body is in space. That's why a lot of these kids would have weighted blankets in bed. The proprioception is what tells you where you are. And um, they'll also maybe have other sensory deficits like the smell or they'll be fussy with taste or they don't like bright lights or um, uh, loud sounds. There may be cognitive problems in visual spatial skills and verbal memory. They can have difficulty in social situations, difficulties with reading and literacy. And that's a big one. And they can be disorganized. But being disorganized is not a DCD diagnosis. And just recently, I've seen quite a few children coming into my clinic with that as the sole criteria for diagnosis. And I'm looking at, you know, my I have other children who are, I see the teenagers disorganized, it goes together. But the reason that children with DCD tend to be organized, disorganized is because they don't have the motor skill. Um, they don't have the motor skills and they don't have the thought processing to organize their thoughts and organize where they're gonna put things. That's the same reason that a lot of children with DCD have really big problems with mathematics because in their brain, that organizational um, hierarchy is, tends to be skewed and math needs a very organized brain. So 
This brings me on to something called comorbidities. Now, I know that's a scary word, okay? But when we talk about comor comorbidities clinically, it's about the stuff that kind of goes along with it. So in DCD, we frequently would find attention problems. So ADD, ADHD, okay? So the kids who can't, not necessarily the kids who are bouncing off the walls or the kids who are like really difficult or naughty or bold, they just have problems concentrating and they need to move a lot. Autistic spectrum disorder, very frequently um, Asperger's or high functioning autism, sensory processing, processing disorder, so it, which I would think actually is a big part of DCD and they all have that. You get anxiety. They feel different. They feel they're not able to do things the same way as their friends. And that's one of the reasons I think it is worth getting a psychological evaluation just even to get an idea of what's going on in your child's head. And if there are any of those comorbidities that you might recognize. And a lot of kids with DCD will go on to have health issues. And that's because they're not generally sporty. They don't, they find it a big difficulty out on the, they're not great at team sports. They're not great at playing ball. They're not great at catching the ball, running around, all that kind of thing. So they have a higher risk of basically gaining weight and, and having associated health risks there. In terms of the prevalence, um, it used to be about 6% of the population. And initially we call it true DCD, which is kind of like the, the, the funny term, but these would be the children who really have everything going on. And a lot of those children would have other stuff going on as well. But, you know, over the years, it was kind of felt that um, because it was such a strict, the, the criteria is so strict, they were missing children who would still have DCD, but maybe not to the same level. So fine motor alone uh, was then included and that brought the, the numbers up. To an extent, as I said, I think it can be overdiagnosed and I tend, I tend to think it can be a little bit of a, a catch-all um, when you know someone isn't really sure. I've, I've, ha I've seen it with my own children. I've seen it with people coming in to me where in schools they say, oh, the child is DCD, but not necessarily. They can be brilliant with motor skills, but just a bit disorganized. Um, in terms of the ratio, four guys to every girl, um, similar to ASD and ADHD. And very importantly, you don't grow out of it. This is not, it's, it's a, a developmental disorder, it's not gonna go away. However, with good intervention and um, support, they do incredibly well. And there are loads of people who have DCD through the generations, going back through the ages, who never were diagnosed and did fantastically well, as we all know. But you know, the, uh, our kids do need that bit more support. But it, to put it down, so in a class of 30 children, you're going to have about two on average, which will have DCD properly, you know, once it's diagnosed properly. So what about vision? So why is vision so important? Um, vision processes 80% of our sensory world. That's a lot of what we learn. 20% of our body's energy is needed to process or to run our visual system. It's part of our brain, and we're talking about our brain, which is, you know, our neuro center, the center of our neural network. What goes into the visual system is processed, and this is this information that tell, tells the body what's, what, what it needs to do. So your vision influences your motor skills. You need to be able to see to be able to do. That vision is essential for learning and development. And Many kids with DCD can see 2020, but the brain just doesn't simply know what to do with it. You can get the information in, but oftentimes, and I'll explain later in the talk why, that information going into the brain is garbled. It's not good information. So the brain can't process it properly and get the information out. So this goes back to our comorbidities, that horrible word, which I really don't like, but um what's in the what is common to all of these what's common to all of these is that little bit in the center there which is vision so i would see very common visual profiles between these three groups because they're all neurological they're all neuroatypical so visual development so the eyes start developing in the womb but actual vision is a learned process the babies when they're born have a really immature visual system. They can't do very much with it. They just need to be able to recognize their mother's face and the human face. 
as baby develops, the visual system develops as well. And as the child's motor skills develop and the baby starts crawling and walking and doing all those things, the visual system is developing really fast to meet those new demands. So the visual system is maturing along with the child's development and any interruption in that process can affect the natural course of motor development. There's been a lot of studies that have actually shown children who are visually impaired don't develop their motor skills and they, 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 their bodies, their brains don't develop in the same way. Vision is critically important to how we develop and how we learn. So we talk about the visual system. We're looking at the eyes, this bit here. We're looking at the nerve, the optic nerve, the bit that goes from the eyes to the brain. And then the brain is the visual processing. And that's back here at the back of the brain. So the actual optical system is the eye and the nerve. And then the perceptual system or the part of the, the, the area that knows what to do with what the information is, how it works processed is actually in the back of the brain. So vision allows us to have a multi-sensory awareness of space. It directs our movement and it allows us to interact with the world around us. Our vision tells us what we need to do to direct our action. So our eyes just get the information. The actual seeing bit, would you believe it is done by the brain? And of course, again, this brings us back to DCD because this is all about what's going on in the brain. And the quality of what goes into that system, what goes into the brain is going to influence what comes out. So how do vision issues affect my child with GCD? They, visual difficulties in the visual system will affect balance, the color your ocular vestibular system, your fine motor skills, your gross motor skills, your sensory processing, and your learning and your memory. Because as I said, if you can't see, you can't do. And we know this, now although I said there hasn't been a huge amount of studies done, technology now has its advanced. Um, we now know that in children with DCD, the visual system has developed a bit differently. And imaging studies show that information to and from the brain flow, flows differently in DCD children or neurotypical children compared to, um, uh, I suppose we say normally developing child or a neurotypical. So the first link, would you believe it, to vision and learning was back in 1950 by this chap called Piaget. And he decided, and you know, it's all a bit of a no-brainer, no I think, but he kind of worked out that normal development requires good vision because of the fact that 80% of it is processed by the brain. So let's go and look at school now. So a typical school-going child will spend 50 to 70% of the day completing close tasks. And 20% of those tasks will require a shift of focus. And actually during lockdown, that's what was really difficult on children because the visual system is not designed for us to be sitting in front of a screen all day. We need to be changing focus all the time, looking from near to far, copying down from the board, shifting focus. Um, anyway, yeah, so the link between vision problems and academic problems or academic deficits has been well established. So vision problems, as I said, they're not all about seeing 2020. So if your child has had an OT or site assessment and you read it, you will have seen words like visual motor skills. Uh, visual perception, the brain understands what it sees, visual dim discrimination, understanding the difference in two objects, um, spotting the difference between two pictures, visual clo closure, which is the ability to recognize a form even when you're only given a part of it, um, visual sequential memory to rec recall a sequence in correct order, um, and that actually is a very important skill for reading, visual spatial to know where the object is in space in the environment. So all of these have one thing in common, the word vision. So to have good visual perception, processing, integration, spatial, et cetera, you need good vision, you need good information getting in there. You have to have the right information getting into the brain. So the actual visual system needs to be working to have the visual skills. But this is why you need a behavioral optometrist. It's not just about seeing 2020 and having a pair of glasses. Okay, because vision and motor skills are very closely intertwined. So if we look at the different parts of the visual system, the vision, the tracking, the perception, they're all the things that we need to come in to learn and develop normally. So for example, vision and gross motor skills. Vision and visual perception, which is processing, gives you the reason to move. It stimulates coordination, it stimulates body control, it's closely aligned with the balance of the vestibular system, we call it the ocular vestibular system. 
and it's very important for motor development. Um, it starts to develop when the child starts rolling, sitting up and crawling on all fours. If your child is a bum shuffler or a bear crawler, and I see that, it's usually, it, it, it can be a little bit of a, um, it's a flag because a child who bum shuffles doesn't learn, hasn't learned to control their neck, their vision, their control, because the whole crawling thing is about bilateral integration. Having said that, you know, my daughter who is DCD actually crawled beautifully. So it's not necessarily a um, follow through for everybody. Um, anyway, so we crawl, then we develop to walk and ride a bike, play sport, dance. All of that requires good balance and good visual processing. Then we can look at vision and fine motor skills. The eyes lead the hand. You have to have good depth perception, good eye convergence, which is bringing your eyes together. You need to be able to integrate your visual perception and your motor control. You have to be able to use good hand-eye coordination for those little fiddly tasks. So visual motor integration is really important for fine motor skills, such as handwriting, buttons and zips, that type of thing. So, we need to be able to see 2020, but we also need to focus. We need to be able to see what it is we're looking at and keep it clear. We need to be able to process. We need to know what is it and where is it? We need to team our eyes. We need to be able to move them together to see on a page, to catch a ball. We need to be able to track, which means following a line of words, following a moving object such as a ball. So focusing skills. This is the ability to be able to focus on an object and see it clearly so you can process what it is. Focusing is really important for reading, for studying, for the classroom and for playing sports. We need to be able to change focus from near to far without difficulty. So somebody with problems in their focusing system is going to present with headaches, avoiding reading or near work, like reading avoidance. They will have uh, problems with visual stamina. So if they're reading for while they get tired, they lose concentration, poor reading comprehension, because they're spending so much of their brain's energy trying to keep the print clear on the page that they actually forget to process what they're reading and they forget what it is and they haven't, they get you know, poor comprehension. The child may also complain of words moving over the page or getting blurred or coming in and out of focus. Then we need eye teaming and that's, you know, our binocular vision. So our eyes need to be able to team and move together equally. So any discrepancy in the teaming system results in symptoms such as double vision, headaches, fatigue, poor concentration, poor attention, rubbing the eyes, poor comprehension when reading, because if you can't track it properly and you're skipping from one line to another, it's not going to make sense. Difficulty in copying from the board near to far work and difficulty in tracking and following anything um that so again like a a, a moving ball um, and again frequently children with difficulties with eye teaming will complain of words falling off the page skipping and rereading and you can see there i have a little um uh, illustration of what normal eye tracking is like we call those cicadic eye movements so we hop from one word to another and then a child who has eye teaming or binocular vision difficulties where they can't track properly they tend to be all over the place and and they hate reading aloud. Absolutely, that's that's a big issue for them. Then we need our central and peripheral vision. So our central vision is what's in the middle. And that that in the in, in the eye is a part of the eye called the fovea. It's about a one million cells concentrated into the fovea. And that's what gives you that small, sharp picture, like six percent of your visual field. Peripheral vision is everything that's going on on the outside. It's about 200,000 cells, and that's the big picture. So your central vision is what gives you detail. What is it? Your peripheral vision is te telling you where it is. It's what's going on around. So it's be allowing you to place something in space. So neurotypicals are, you know, most of us can process these two things at the same time. We're driving a car. We can look at the road, but we know what's going on beside us. We can reach for a glass on the table and know where the glass is on the table and where everything else, how we can negotiate, negotiate around all the other things. But children with DCD find that really, really difficult because they can only run one or the other at a time, but not the two together. So this is one of the things that can contribute to this clumsy behavior of, you know, they want to 
they're walking to a particular target in a room and they'll fall, they, it's like they don't see the chair or they'll fall over nothing in particular. Um, they go to reach for a glass or a, a beaker on a desk and knock everything else over because they don't see it. It hasn't registered in their peripheral vision. It also affects literacy because when you read, you're reading each word. Well, in fact, you're looking at about three words in your central vision, but you're processing in the periphery what's coming before and after in the sentence. So that allows your eyes to track because and, and make sense because you're working out what's being there, what I'm reading, what's coming next. That gives you the big picture of comprehension. So fixation is the ability to hold the eye steady on the target. So we need to be able to fixate. So we need to be able to focus, fixate on the target and process what it is. We need to be able to pursue a target if it's moving and pursuit eye movements are long, smooth eye movements, as I said, like tracking a plane across the sky or a moving ball. And saccades are the ability to move eyes rapidly. So they're short, quick movements between a point. So for example, looking at a face, we would use saccadic eye movements, moving from one eye to the other, like just tracking the different, scanning a face, try, tracking the different um, features. But eye movement should be done with no head movement and no body movement. So this is another thing we look at. And what I found in my, my, my research, and I see it here in the clinic all the time, children with DCD have problems, huge problems with their eye movements. They find it really difficult to fixate and they use head directed gaze. So instead of smoothly following a target, they will move their head to look at something. They use their head to track and to follow. They use their head to read. They're the typewriter readers. The heads will be like this. And this is not efficient. As human beings, we evolved above all the other species. And one of the things that made us, brought us so high up the evolutionary tree is the fact that we can actually move our eyes without having to move our head. It makes us really good hunters. So um, particularly in the classroom uh, and, and learning and reading, head directed movement is, is not fit, efficient and it's not going to meet the demands of playing sports and learning in school. So we need to develop the ability to track and follow a moving target without moving your head and just using their eyes. And that actually then helps you to process what you're looking at much more efficiently. So when I'm training a child in the clinic and we're doing exercises, one of my first goals is to develop independent eye movement. So the problems in DCD, we have problems with eye movement, the use of head directed gaze, problems with steady fixation, difficulty in training fixation on the target and processing what it is to get that fine detail, problems with eye teaming. And this is not about having a squint, okay? It's just that the eyes don't, the innervation to the eye is different, so the eyes don't move together. And this means that the brain is getting garbled information. This causes problems of processing because the brain is getting all this information. Plus already a lot of these children will have sensory processing deficits. So they're not quite sure what to do with this information that's coming in. Problems with focusing, finding it difficult to hold fixation, to keep it clear and to change fixation. Sorry, my dog has just decided to join us. Um, so problems with fo focusing. So a lot of these kids, and this is what I found in my study, is that they have difficulty in keeping a clear focus. So you know, people when we get to sort of like 45 and we have to get reading glasses so that's quite normal when you're 45 but I was seeing a lot of kids with DCD who have the near vision of a 55 or 60 year old and um, they can't hold it clear so they're, they, they find that close tasks are blurred and this is going to affect your fine motor skills if you can't see and track what you're doing up close you can't write properly so it's not just about the sort of the, um, the physicality of holding the pencil, there's, there's other skills there as well. And as I discussed already, the problems of peripheral and central vision and knocking things over. So, um, how does it affect motor skills? Can't change focus to fix and keep it clear. You can't process what it is or where it is. You can't follow it as, your move, as, as it moves. So you need to know what your body needs to do to execute the action from the information that's coming in. So motor skills, if you can't see what you're meant to be doing, you're not going to know what to do. The body doesn't learn what to do. Now I'm gonna to briefly touch on academic difficulties because I think I've, I've, I've kind of discussed this already. But again, for reading, you need to be able to fixate and focus to keep 
of the words clear. This is really difficult for kids with, with DCD. If you can't do that, you can't track across the page and you can't take in more than one word at a time. And then for again, that makes comprehension quite hard. So if I have DCD and I'm struggling to keep my words clear and keep my eyes teeming and stop from moving my head when I read, it makes reading uncomfortable, concentration difficult, and therefore I'm not gonna to want to read. And reading difficulties and poor academic performance in DCD is, has been well, well established right from the early days of research. And we know it can lead to academic, you know, academic difficulties and social anxiety and, uh, and um, a feeling of isolation. A lot of these kids too can be misdiagnosed with dyslexia. So dyslexia is a phonetical, it's a phonological disorder. So the part of the brain that decodes words just isn't, doesn't work the same way. So again, if a child can't see closely, clearly, okay, um, therefore they don't actually learn to read properly. So they may not actually have true dyslexia. They may have just developed acquired dyslexia because they can't see the words clear. They're not able to track. So therefore it doesn't really make sense. And um, so how can we change it? So this is the good news. The visual system is what we call plastic. Neurologically, you can change things because it's part of the brain, the eyes are part of the brain. It's, it's actually a really good shortcut straight into the sensory processing system and the neurologic system of the body. So the visual system can be changed. It can be trained and taught new skills. And you can really do that at any age. Ideally, you want the child to be old enough to be able to cognitively work with you um, and not too old that they have developed lots of really bad habits. But having said that, I have worked with some adults and I've had some really good um, results. So while OTs will do some work on tracking and they will do eye work and they do amazing work in terms of balance, the problem is, if you, have a pro if you have a difficulty with your visual system and you're not processing, you're not going to optimize that intervention that you're getting from the OT if your eyes don't know how to track and make the changes that they need to. So this brings me on, on to what I do. So as a behavioral optometrist, I look at the hardware. I look at the eyes. I look at the teaming. I look at it. And then I look at the software. And I'm kind of working out is, it are all the bits of hardware there and working properly to give good information to the software so it can be programmed and uh, processed properly. So our job is to work through all these layers, starting at the front, all the way back and right out to the visual motor integration, hand-eye coordination and reading. We look at all those aspects of the visual system so it is not like a normal eye test. Real vision is dynamic, okay? So you go and you get your eyes tested and you sit in the chair in the opticians and you read a chart. When are you gonna do that in normal life? That's just gonna tell you that you need glasses or not. You're seriously like, you know, you're, you're chasing buses, you're driving your car, you're not sitting in a room staring at a chart. Even when you're in a classroom, you're changing focus from near to far. So it is not all about being able to see what's on that chart, but it is a good start. So we do kind of like to get that bit right. We need to make sure that we've got clear vision. Okay. And then we use, so we do a full detailed eye test with a neurological workup. We examine the eye teaming. So we look at your binocular vision. We look at how the two eyes are processing together. We look at the strength, stability, and flexibility of the different eye muscles because the nerves might be sending the information to the eye muscles, but if the eye muscles aren't responding appropriately, and this again tends to be a problem with children for DCD because a lot of them have, can have hypotonicity or poor muscle tone. So if the eye muscles can't act, it doesn't matter how much innervation is going to that muscle. So we have to check that. We then look at the focusing system of the eye. So this child might be able to see 2020. And then I give them a book to read and they say, well, like that's all blurry or yeah, no, I can't see it. The, 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 the word a lot of them tell me is it's fizzy. It's fizzy, I can't see it, it's moving. Um, it's blurred. So they're fine when they're small, when they, you give them, you know, the small textbooks and you've got the really big print. But then as they start going up through school and print gets smaller and more crowded, it can, it's a nightmare for them. So we look at the focusing system of the eye. Then we assess the eye movement. So how effective are you? Remember I talked about pursuits and caves and fixation. 
So we look to see, can you do this? Can, can your child do this without moving their head or their body? Are they using head directed gaze? <clears throat> then I look to see how well they're integrating their central and peripheral vision. Then I take them and I do a series of functional tests. And all of these tests have normative data. So they're not kind of floofy tests. Um, you know, I, this, this is proper. These have all been uh, developed using normative data from thousands of different studies. And that gives an idea in terms of, um, you know, where your child is on the norms. And again, if you have a child with DCD, you will know all about norms. And then we look at the whole picture. Um, we decide what the problem is. And then I will design a protocol specific to what each child's needs and diagnosis is. So as I said, I might have some children who will have additional diagnosis or I said that horrible word of comorbidities. So. I would start by prescribing glasses if needed for a distance vision, if the vision isn't 2020. I may prescribe glasses if they need to support ear vision. So some children, if you, if you, some children who come to me, I put them into bifocals and they do really well with them because their distance vision is perfect, but they need a little bit of help up close. Some then children I will have to put on, I, I do vision therapy and maybe doing that with or without glasses. And we do that through task-based learning. And this is this is like a long established um, uh, protocol that our brain learns better by doing things, by doing the same repetitive thing. You're training muscle memory, you're tra training nerve memory. And then I might work in collaboration and I often do with OT, psychology, speech and language therapists in some instances, and you know, link in with the school. I think it's really important that we work as a multidisciplinary team with the parent and the child at the center of it. When we do vision therapy, vision therapy varies for every child because you know you can have a profile, but you could have several different profiles. So you need, there is no one size fits all. So to do proper vision therapy, that you're not wasting your time and that you're battling with your child every night because I'm doing a load of exercises that are pointless, you need to use activities that are specifically designed to target your child deficit. So we would look at task-based activities, develop fixation, localization, eye movement, hand-eye coordination, bilateral integration, which is like the left and the right side of the body moving together, the left and right side of the visual fields, the vestibular system working on balance, um, depth perception, and training central and peripheral focus. So I would have a menu. Oh my God, I think I have about three or 400 activities at this stage. All different, all done in different combinations to help with the child um, according to their age, their level of interest and their level of ability. There is no point in me giving something that I'm working with a, set, a five or a seven or an eight year old on a 13 or a 14 year old because you might be doing the same thing but you have to take a different approach. I thought at this stage I'd have to put in something about screens and vision because, you know, I mean, I think we're all, it's the one thing I have it on my questionnaire. Does your child have access to screen time? And well, before COVID, all the parents sort of say, yes, but it's my, now it's like, oh my God, COVID is totally like blown it out the window. And everyone's like freaked out. And it's just, it is the way it is. Um, but the problem with screen time, kids with DCD love their screens, they love their tablets because they don't have to do anything. They just sit there and it does all the work for them. They don't have to think. They occasionally have to push. And the parents say, is that not good hand-eye coordination? No, actually it's not because it's not 3D. They're just, you know, touching a screen. So that's why I have a massive issue with um, uh, uh, vision therapy programs that you buy online. We're trying to train our child to move in a 3D world. You cannot do that on a screen. You're just, you're really fixing those bad habits. And in, in, in I, I think it's not a positive thing at all. So prolonged use of screen time, it just doesn't fit, uh, develop the visual spatial skills. It causes focusing problems, a loss of motor skills, fatigue, and it overstimulates the brain. The kids will often have issues with um, with sleep and um, because it's this over excitation of the brain it doesn't actually wreck your eyes contrary to popular belief don't tell your kids that now i thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about what what should we be doing when we have to use um uh, a computer so we need good lighting 
we need to use slant board. And actually, I would often say for these kids, slant boards are brilliant. And if there's any teachers out there and you get like, if you remember the old days of in a classroom, all the desks were slanted and they were all arranged facing the teacher. And now our kids are sitting around tables and there's books and pencils and it's completely scattered environment. Well, this is in um, primary level anyway. And for a child who's DCD, who has organizational problems and they have difficulty finding things in space, that cluttered table in the classroom can be a nightmare then they might find that they have a right left issue of bilateral integration and they're sitting at the side and they're having to look over at the teacher. Um, so oftentimes when I'm writing a report, I will try and make recommendations to make the child's working environment a little bit more comfortable. And one of those things is a slam board because as I said, the old desks, if you remember, so you know, who look like myself, um, all those desks had a slant on them. And the reason being our vision actually works better in that slanted position. It's like a natural curve. We need to look at our posture to make sure our backs are nice and straight and feet supported. So if your child is doing a lot of reading and writing or doing their homework and their legs are dangling off the chair, yeah, they're gonna slide off that chair. They're not going to want to sit. And the next thing is they're chucking the legs under them. They're sticking the legs up in the chair beside them. Get a box, get a box or a laundry basket or something upside down underneath them so they can rest their feet on it. It gives great support. Sometimes the children are being given um, sit and move cushions, and the, the, the teacher says, absolutely used it. They slide off the sit and move cushions and say, stick them on the floor, put them on, the, put their feet on them. It gives really good proprioceptive feedback. Making sure that they're working at the correct distance. So we call this from your elbow to your fist is called Harmon's distance. And this is actually the distance that our eyes are designed to work at. So um, it's important that, you know, they shouldn't be sitting too far back or too far forward. Or the child who writes with their head leaning off the side of the desk, they're holding the pen in one hand and the head is like off the other side of the desk and they're slouched off the side of the chair. Um, that's not the correct working distance and that child has vision problems. Uh, and, and this child, they do that as a compensatory kind of um, positioning. I'm trying to take a break. And this is for all of us in the audience. The 2020 20, 20 rule, every 20 minutes, take 20 blinks, look 20 meters away, take the 20 second walk around the room and try to get some daylight. Good vision therapy. Um, so this is stuff you can do at home. So you don't, uh, as I say to parents, there's the concentrated stuff I do with your kids, but the rest is expensive play dates. And you don't want to be coming up to me for expensive play dates. Stuff you can do at home, be the creative. Obstacle courses, um, you know, a couple of chairs, duvets, be creative, get them out in the garden. In the playground, the playground visually is amazing. There's so much stuff you can work on in the vestibular, and processing. Uh, trampoline, I love trampolines, really, really good. Don't get them on the trampoline and let them bounce to hell out of it. That's it. If you want to do as the vision activity, try to get them to jump down the trampoline and maybe throw a ball to you or catch a ball or give them some sort of a, a vision game with it. Jumping, hopping and skipping games, really, really good. You could do like a hot scotch or a maze on the ground with chalk and get them to jump, hop, skip, around that or doing their obstacle courses where they're um, crawling or doing, you know, crawling commando or whatever. Um, throwing and catching a ball, a rebound net, absolutely fantastic because when I was growing up, we loads of space and there were the days you could go around to the end of the terrace, the houses are on the back wall and throw the, the, the ball and catch it off the wall. Modern living doesn't really support that anymore, but you can get these lovely things called rebound nets, which were designed for training rugby players and uh, cricket players. And you can use them at home for just the throwing and catching skills of hand-eye coordination. Doing jigsaws, tanograms, parquetry puzzles, all those kind of things, hugely important, great for fine motor skills and great for visual integration. Mazes dot to dot, really good for tracking. And spotting the difference, word searches, where's, where's Wally, all those kind of games, really, really good. The kids don't, some kids love them, some kids hate them. The kids who hate them generally need them. It's always the way. If you don't like it, it's good for you. Um, doing things like threading cards, making jewellery, um, but stuff that requires fine eye control. Um, 
there's a lot, as I said, a lot of this stuff, I would say do it as a backup or a support. So I kind of give homework. So I give a, a series of exercises, which is the you know, targeted exercise when I'm working on a particular skill or a particular muscle. But when you do it tied in with all these other games, your obstacle courses, your playgrounds, you're, you're using mo fine and gross motor skills. So you're catching up on all that stuff, all that development that the child may have missed out on because of their problems with their coordination. So it's about building confidence as well. So that's it. I bet you're delighted now that I'm finished, but um, I hope what I said made sense. Um, and I would be delighted to take any questions. Thank you.